Hello there, welcome to the Football Block. My name is Brandon. Today we're going to look back at the 2022 World Cup quarterfinals and see how my predictions went. So if that sounds interesting, then let's hop right into it. So the quarterfinals have come to a close. Four teams go home. We only have four teams left. And man, what a round. What a selection of games that we have here to talk about. And I gotta say, our, uh, we'll get to each game individually, but as a fan of Ronaldo, someone of Portuguese descent, this one this was pretty rough. It was very, very sad. Um, but before we get into that game, let's start off with the first match. We have Brazil versus Croatia, and I already did a video looking at this one specifically from a Brazilian point of view already, so if you're interested in that, check that out. Um, but Brazil was shocked here by Croatia. What the heck happened? We have a huge shock here. Not that many shocks in round 16, but this is a massive one here in the quarterfinals. Brazil, the pre-tournament favorites, you can make an argument they had the most talented squad, the most well-rounded team going into the tournament. They go home before the semifinals, and yet again, Brazil goes out in the quarterfinals to a European team. Uh, now, I think overall, as I talked about this in my other video, I think Brazil was the better team. I think Brazil should have went through, but it's their own fault for not going through. They didn't manage the game well. Um, I think you can ask huge questions of Chiche. I don't really think it's specifically on any of the players. Now, yes, the goal that Croatia did score was from the fault of Fred and uh, Alexandro, but... It was Chiche's fault for making defensive substitutions at that point of the game where he should have just went for the victory to increase the victory. Uh, my prediction was that Brazil was going to come away with a 2-0 victory. I thought that it would be a dominant but not easy win. I thought that uh, Brazil ultimately, ultimately were going to break down Croatia's defense and Croatia was not going to be able to hit them on the counter. Um, and that is looking that's how the game was looking like for a majority of the 120 minutes because it went to extra time uh, brazil was in the driver's seat they had majority of the possession majority of the chances i feel like they didn't create enough uh, but staying that they were still the better team and eventually they did break through a beautiful goal by neymar uh just at the end of the first half of extra time and then from that moment on it looked like brazil was cruising and they should have went for the juggler. It, it was looking like they should have gone and scored a second or third goal, but then they took their foot off the gas. Croatia and this Croatian team, we've seen for the past five years, uh, they never give up, they never surrender. They just kept going at it. And then, um, you know, because Brazil made some defensive substitutions, they left themselves open on the counter. Croatia came in, Pekovic scored. Now, yes, he did get a bit of a lucky deflection there, but still, you know, goal's a goal. Went to penalties, and then Croatia is almost unbeatable on penalties. Uh, and Brazil, go home. And like I said, um, Brazil have no one to blame but themselves. Uh, but big credit to Croatia. Their defense was was strong. They stood in there, and the attack, with the few chances that they had, obviously with that one goal, they were able to capitalize on the very few chances that they had. And then Lovakovic in goal. Uh, by far the best goalkeeper of the tournament at this stage. You know, three saves against Japan in the round of 16, penalty shootout. And then I don't know how many saves here against Neymar and Vinicius and Antony. And then obviously he made that really important save against Rodrigo in the penalty shootout as well. So uh, big credit to Lovakovic, big credit to Croatia. Uh, and then Brazil, you know, it's such a shame because they have no one to blame but themselves, as I said many times already. Uh, next, let's move on to the other match that day. We had Argentina versus Netherlands. And man, what a game this was. Uh, if the other game was, you know, slightly boring, I don't want to say boring, but it was very tense, very tactical. This game, it was wide open, especially in uh, extra time and the end of the second half. This game really had some fireworks in there. Um, Argentina, I feel like they came out the gate swinging. They dominated the game. They, their superior talent going forward really kind of just flattened the Netherlands. The Netherlands looked lost up top. They didn't have a single shot on target up until the 82nd minute. It was all Argentina from that point. Messi was running the show. He had a beautiful run where he dribbled past, I, I think, three defenders. 
amazing, absolutely amazing pass to Molina, the right back. Uh, and then he poked the ball past Newpert and Argentina go up one nothing. And um, quick point about Argentina's lineup, Lionel Scaloni switched up the formation. He went for three at the back. He wanted to match um, the attack for Netherlands. They were playing Bergwijn and uh, Memphis up top. So Scaloni, he wanted to take out a winger and then put another defender there to match up three to two. And I was a little skeptical, skeptical going into that uh, match because Argentina have never played with three at the back before under Scaloni, but it paid off. Uh, the defense, I thought, there were some shaky moments there, and we'll get onto that, but for the most part, I think they did well, specifically with covering Depay and Burt Wine, as they had nothing in front of goal. Then the second half started, it's more of the same, uh, and then um, Argentina had some really close chances, but they ultimately got the second goal through a penalty, Messi scored a penalty. Now, I have to admit, I think this penalty was a little soft. Dumfries took down Acuna in the box. The foul did happen in the box, but it is soft. I, I still think, ultimately, it's a penalty, but still, Argentina, they scored. It's 2 nothing, and they were in cruise control. It was looking like everything was fine. Uh, but Van Hal showed his tactical awareness. I mean, this guy, he's in his 70s. He's been uh, coaching since uh, the 90s, I believe. Um, and, you know, he made a, a switch and it paid off. He put on Vogt Weghorst and he put on Luke de Jong. Uh, utilized the height advantage that the Dutch have. Now, obviously, just in general, the Netherlands is one of the tallest countries by average in the world. And Argentina is not as tall. I mean, just look at their defenders. Uh, Lissandro Martinez, as good as a defender as he is. He's, I think, 5'6", five, 5'7". Um, and then, you know, Altamendi is not the biggest guy either. And it's it's hilarious because in uh, the round of 16 matchup against France last time in the 2018 World Cup, Argentina had these really tall defenders like uh, Federico Fazio, Marcus Rojo. I don't know if you guys remember these defenders. And they were very tall, very good in the air, but they were just slow, like, like so slow, no pace at all. Um, so now Argentina have the opposite. And if anything, they could have used a Federico Fazio or a Ezekiel Garay or a Dimitrios or someone like that. Because all it took was one cross into the box and a vague horse header, 2-1 to Argentina, Netherlands back in the game. And from that moment on, I feel like Argentina actually lost a bit of composure. The Dutch had a lot of really close chances. They were really pushing. They were really sending some dangerous balls into the box. They had some really dangerous set pieces. Uh, and then the match was getting a little feisty. There was a huge fight there. Leonardo Paredes had a tackle on, I believe it was Ake. And then he decided to boot the ball right into the Dutch bench, which erupted into a huge fight. And, you know, Messi's my favorite player, so I'm rooting for Argentina. But I have to admit, I think... Uh, Paredes should have probably been sent off. Uh, there was two infractions there. Obviously the attack or tackle on Ake. Uh, he completely missed the ball. He had two feet into the tackle. He got, he got called the foul. Uh, he didn't even get a yellow card for that. I think that could have been a red card. And then booting the ball directly at the Dutch bench. You could argue that should, be, should have been a red card as well. But he got lucky. No card there. Uh, a point on the ref, uh, Mateo Lajas. Not particularly a big fan of this referee. He's a Spanish referee. I've seen him a lot in refereeing La Liga games. Again, not the biggest fan of him. His refereeing style was very, very strange. Uh, the opening, I would say, 20 minutes of the match, he was giving out cards like crazy. He was giving out cards for fouls that I don't really think should have been cards. And then, as the match went on, then he wasn't calling anything. Uh, I mean, he, he there was fouls like the, the one I just mentioned with Praise that could have been a red card. He didn't even get any card uh, and then towards the end of the match then he started throwing out cards like crazy again like there's just no consistency there very strange officiating um and i think you know both sides are aggravated with the referee like i said that penalty sh a shout the dutch would argue that shouldn't really have been a penalty but then there was a few cards here and there there's a few calls um that really shouldn't have gone uh, netherlands way as well earlier on in the match but if you think the craziness ended there it absolutely did not because in the 90 plus 11th minute virtually the last kick of the game Netherlands had a free kick right in front of Argentina's 18. Uh, Coop Myers instead of shooting the ball passed it to Veghorst and Veghorst used his physical strength his size he was able to push Enzo Fernandez off the ball he was able to scuff a shot into the net and next you know it's 2-2 it sends the game right into extra time. What a insane match we have here. 
Um, and then from that moment on, I, I think that Argentina, I think they were the better team throughout the majority of the match. And then that really came to show. And, you know, as good as the Dutch were, as good, as, as commendable as their fight to claw back to 2-2 was, I think that Argentina, their just talent showed through. They had a host of chances. Enzo Fernandez had a shot that was deflected. He had one that hit the post. Messi had a shot. Uh, uh, Lautaro Martinez came off the bench and had a shot that was saved. But unlucky for them, it didn't go in. It went to penalties, and Emmy Martinez, who is a master at penalty shootouts, he really made a name for himself in the Copa America in that penalty shootout against Colombia. He stood up, saved two penalties, and Argentina go through with Lautaro scoring the uh, decisive penalty. Um, so overall, I think uh, my prediction was not right. I said that Argentina was going to win 3-1. Um, now, I, I think the edge or like the, the flow of the game for the most part was correct. I thought Argentina would, for the most part, dominate, but the Dutch would find their way back in. But then Messi magic would see them go through. And we did see some Messi magic. Obviously, Messi was an amazing player on the pitch. But, um, you know, it, it, it was tough. It was a lot more tough than that. It wasn't a straightforward win. Um, I, I think that Argentina, you know, this team is not as good as I thought they were going to be heading into the tournament. Now, now, saying that they're still, you know, you can argue the best team still in the tournament, but I, I thought that they would have much more composure at the back. There's times where when Argentina go down, they look rattled, they look a little shocked. Um, we saw that against Saudi Arabia in the opening match, and we saw that briefly here. Now, they were able to recover. But still, there's cause for concern. They've conceded five goals throughout the tournament so far. Usually a champion, usually, usually a champion concedes no more than four. Uh, sometimes they concede as, as least as like two, like Italy and Spain. Um, so I, there is cause for concern. That doesn't mean that Argentina can't win it, but still there, there's cause for concern there. So now let's look on to the next two matches. We have Portugal versus Morocco uh, and you know this match as I said before at the beginning of the video this this was tough to watch um, I thought Portugal I don't really even think that they necessarily played bad I thought that they had some really good chances Bono was forced into some really good saves I saw I thought Joao Felix had a good game um, Ramos didn't really do much up top uh, he didn't really have an opportunity to um, you know Morocco's defense was insane and I think this was ultimately the deciding factor now, you can, you know, criticize Diogo Costa for uh, end the series goal. Um, Morocco scored with a beautiful header from end the series just before halftime. And, you know, you can criticize Diogo Costa because he came out to punch the ball away or catch it and he missed. But I don't think it's 100% on him now. A goalie of his stature should probably be you know, doing a little better on a cross like that. But at the same time, the cross was at a very awkward distance. Like, it was close enough to the goal that the goalkeeper can come out but it was far enough away that it wouldn't be an easy cut like he really had to make up some space for that it was that it was like the perfect cross it was more so on the cross being a perfect cross and then the header from Enesiri like the the fact that he got there first um I think it's more so in Enesiri than Kosa but still you can there's um you know you can criticize him for that uh, slightly and from that moment on Morocco they just you know utilized their insane defensive tactic their game plan that they've used in every single match this World Cup um, and it's so surprising because you know we saw Morocco at the AFCON last year uh, under their previous manager they were disappointing they didn't really look that good their team's very talented you can argue they're the most talented team in Africa um, but they just, they weren't that good. And then at the um, World Cup qualifiers, they got through, but there was, you know, some, they, they got through easily. They had an easy opponent. And even still, they, they conceded some goals there. They switched their manager around. ZH came back. None of us really knew what to expect for Morocco in this tournament. But I got to say, they have by far the best defense of this tournament. And the team overall, the, the team collective is insane. This manager um, and all his tactics have been perfect. Uh, but... Still, they've conceded one goal. They're in the semifinals. They only conceded one single goal this entire World Cup, and it was an own goal, a lucky own goal uh, against Canada. That, that is just, that's nuts. Uh, and, you know, Portugal kept pushing on. Ronaldo got subbed on. He had one chance at the end. Uh, it was saved by Bono. Again, like, you can criticize Ronaldo and say that he's old, he's not clinical, or, or you know, an older Ronaldo, or a younger Ronaldo would have scored that, but I think it was at a very tight angle. I don't really think it's it's down to him on this one. Um, he had a few chances, but you know, again, it's it's he didn't 
it's not like the game against Korea where he had some chances where he really should have scored. Um, and, and same with the rest of the Portuguese team. Like, look, I, I criticize Fernando Santos. I, I don't think he's the best guy for the job at this point. But I don't necessarily think he did anything wrong in this game. I think this is more so just Morocco's defense just paying off. And that, that's what happens at the World Cup is just, you know, sometimes a team is just in form and they're just almost unbeatable. And I think that's what this Morocco team is. But that being said, it doesn't make the defeat any less painful. This is so sad to see Ronaldo uh, finish his World Cup career like this. Um, you know, I, I think it was an honorable performance from him this tournament. Obviously, he's not at the great height that he once was. It's not like the 2018 World Cup where he was scoring hat-tricks against Spain. But, you know, just seeing him walk off the field in tears like that, I got him. And I, I, I did tear up a little bit myself as well. So it was very painful. My prediction was that Morocco was going to lose 1-0. I thought it was going to be a really late goal from Portugal. And I got the score right, but I got the wrong team going through unfortunately so but credit to morocco uh like i said their game plan their game plan was executed perfectly next we have the final quarterfinal matchup england versus france probably the most anticipated matchup here two heavyweights slugging it out and you know it's really uh 50 50 uh to uh, either team could have gone through because both teams have visible flaws but at the same time both teams were in good form um, this match was super exciting uh, from the get-go. I thought that, um, you know, England probably was the better team early on, but then all it took was one shot for True Many, a beautiful goal where he just, you know, took one touch and then a low shot right into the corner. No chance for Pickford, nutmegged Bellingham as the ball went through. Um, and, you know, France, you can argue, are the most talented team just in terms of squad or the most talented team in the world. Uh, and it really showed there and, and throughout the match as well. I ultimately think that's what pushed France through, is just their superior talent. Um, it, you know, the shot came out of nowhere, really. Uh, France wasn't really having that many chances. All they needed was that one shot, and then they're one nothing up. I think England was a little shocked, but they were able to regain composure. They had some really close chances. Harry Kane had two shots that were saved as well. Uh, and then into the second half, England got a penalty, deservedly so. Harry Kane slotted it away. A wonderful shot. No chance for Lloris there. And then it was all England from that point on. Um, I, Jude Bellingham had a volley that was saved. Lloris was made into a few other clinical saves as well. But then France had a few shots on the counter. Um, and then all it took was one cross from Griezmann, who... Had a wonderful game, two assists. He's been having a really good tournament, even though he hasn't been a goal scorer. Um, wonderful cross from Griezmann into Giroud. Heads it into the corner. That's it, 2-1 to France. Um, again, I don't really think France played all that well. I don't really think France overall has been that good this tournament. Now, they've been good, but I don't know. I, they do have some very visible flaws with their defense, but it's just individual talent has been what's pushing them through. And, and teams have won the World Cup like this before. I mean, Brazil in 2002, in my opinion, um, is more down to individual talent than really the team overall just being an insane team. But and like I said, Giroud put up France 2-1, and then England, I felt like they were just deflated after that point. They, you know, they pushed so hard, and yet they all they had was that one goal from Kane at the penalty spot to show for it. They did have a lifeline, though with only a few minutes left, a clear foul in the box on Mason Mount. Uh, kind of a silly foul. I, I don't know why Tio Hernandez decided to shoulder check um, uh, Tio, um, Mason Mount down. And then Kane stepped up for another penalty. And this one, like, I, I was watching this game with my friends. I said to them, I don't think he's going to score this. And um, we all agreed, like, just his walk up, he, he looked a little nervous, and he skied the penalty. It went right over the bar. Um, you know, sad scenes for England fans, and that was it. France go through 2-1. My prediction was exactly correct. I, saw, I thought that France would win 2-1, um, and you know, I'm proud of that prediction. I, I thought it was good. I, I was right about that one, but that means that it's not, it's not the most, uh, like, you know, I catch I'm sure a lot of people said 2-1 to France or 2-1 to England. That's not, you know, it's the most common score line in soccer, but still, um, I'm proud of myself that I got that one exactly correct. But now England go home, and I, I have to admit, similar story with uh, Santos in Portugal. I don't really think that Southgate did anything wrong in this match in particular. Like, I've criticized Southgate. I've criticized this England team. I think that they have been overrated at times. I don't think Southgate is the right guy for the job. He's done some good things, obviously. They're, defensively, they're, for the most part, have been very strong. But 
you know, like I don't really think that he did anything all that bad. I, I thought this was actually just if you if you forget the goals and just look at the play on the field. I thought England played really good, actually. This is, I thought this is one of um, Southgate's best performances, just in terms of playing style. Result aside, just playing style. I thought this was one of Southgate's best performances for England. And yet, he came away with a loss. But that, that's that's football for you. That's the World Cup. Individual players sometimes come through. And it's, you know, you look at France and how much individual talent they had. Obviously, Mbappe has been the star of the tournament this so, uh, up to this point. And Mbappe didn't really have a good game. I, I thought that he did pretty much nothing. I thought Kyle Walker did a wonderful job of closing him down and not really giving him any space to do anything. But even though Mbappe is kind of uh, marked out of the game, you still have Griezmann putting in these incredibly dangerous balls into the box. And then you have Giroud who's just hopping up and scoring the most clinical goals that you need for France. And that's ultimately what pushed him through in the end. So anyway, guys, let me know what you thought of the quarterfinals. Let me know how your predictions went. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with a friend. And anyway, guys, my name is Brandon. This has been the Football Block. Hope you guys have a nice rest of your night.